Thank you very much, uh, the musicians, Brother Antoine and uh, Brother Lina. Thank you for that music. It's calming music. I think I needed a little bit of that to make sure I am calm um, in front of such uh, an august uh, audience. We are talking about the end times. Let's see if I can project. Yes. We are talking about preparing for the end times. And um, maybe before, before I begin, let's just pause for prayer again. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for allowing us to live in this time which when we anticipate your soon coming. We pray that you may help us, that even as we discuss our relationships, we pray that indeed you may uh, transform each one of us. May it be possible that we will really reflect, reflect what you have in mind for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe we live in the end times. And this, of course, comes from many uh, different angles of looking at scripture. We look at, uh, for instance, the, the churches of Revelation that depict the different time periods. We believe that we are living in Laodicea, that is the last church, and so we are believing, living in the end times. We also believe that we are seeing many of uh, the signs of Christ's coming, and because of that, we are convinced that we are living in the end time. For us as Adventists, our very name, we call ourselves Adventists because we are conscious of the second coming of Jesus. And so because of that, we are convinced that we are living in the end times. I don't think it is our purpose tonight to try and uh, convince each other that we are living in the end times. We do believe that we are living in the end times. And we, uh, you know, we can see that from so many different angles. That we can uh, that we can look at tonight. We are we are looking at uh, relational issues uh, as part of our preparation for the second coming of Christ. That's uh, what we are looking for. Let me just mention, maybe try to outline uh, how I am uh, trying to handle this topic. I want to begin actually. I want to begin by looking at the beginning times before we talk about relationships in the end times, I want to characterize the perfect harmony that was there at creation. I want to spend just a few moments talking a little bit about that. And then I want to highlight the fact that sin disrupted the perfect harmony that was there. And we see that uh, from that time, relationships have been, you know, there, there have been challenges with relationships. We will look at the time of Jesus, for instance, and we will see that actually by that time, love had grown cold, if we, want, if we may use that expression. So uh, I will look a little bit at that particular time aspect as well. But I will want to highlight that while love had grown cold in general in the world, the apostolic church seemed to have very positive relationships. And I want to try to highlight some of those, uh, you know, some ways in which those relationships were highlighted. Then I want to uh, take us to some texts in which there is a prediction made by Christ, also made by Paul. This is just a sampling that shows us that indeed love will grow cold in the end times. And this is the time in which uh, we live. And yet, we will also see that uh, from Christ's teachings, there is definite teaching that uh, we should be very mindful of how we relate to one another. Because judgment is actually depicted as being very closely related to how we treat one another. And so that is one of the things that I will also try to point out. And then I will want to close by 
reading a few verses in the Bible that point to the perfect harmony that we anticipate when we are in the new earth, after God would have created a new heaven and a new earth. And so as believers living in the end times, I guess one of the things that I will want to highlight is that our blueprint for relationships is actually the origin, what we had, the harmony, the perfect harmony that we had at the beginning. And it is the same harmony that we anticipate when Christ comes and the earth is recreated. And so uh, for us as believers living in the end times, our role is to live, to try and, and, and live in that kind of atmosphere, so to speak. That is what I would like. And so let's go to the beginning. Let's go to the beginning. Relationships in Eden. Well, what we do find is that in Eden there were perfect relationships that were depicted, um, you know, when, when creation is, is described. I'm not going to read all the texts that pertain to that, but I simply want to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, which kind of, um, you know, summarizes God's view of uh, the creation that he had made. In fact, every day of creation, we, are, we, we have that uh, evaluative statement where uh, God, you know, we are told by the writer that God looked at what he had created and he saw it was very good. And I take it that uh, when God assessed things and he called them very good, there was no disharmony, there was no conflict. I think it was not just good in terms of uh, aesthetics, in terms of uh, how things looked, but it is the order of things that was actually very good. Genesis 1 verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made Behold, it was very good. I believe that this characterized even the issue of uh, relationships as well, the harmony that was there. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 suggests that uh, God seemed to have been visiting Adam and Eve in the coolness of the, evening, uh, of the day. That is, towards the end of the day, God used to visit them. And they appeared to be very comfortable with him. It was a healthy relationship that was there. Now, unfortunately, of course, we are told about this when uh, you know, the description is actually about what happened after sin came into the world because God came, I presume, as usual. But sin had come into the world and things were no longer usual. Adam and Eve chose to run away. So the visit before sin, was perfect. Basically what I'm trying to say here is the relationship between God and humanity before sin came into the world was perfect. It was perfect harmony. And maybe that is really the blueprint that we should be looking at. Take a look at uh, Adam's uh, the words of describing Eve after she was created. You find hints that uh, the relationship was very healthy. Uh, because he says, this now is born of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So they, 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 these are good expressions that, uh, that uh, he, he, he uses. But of course we know that after sin came into the world, she no longer spoke of uh, born of my bone, she, I mean rather, he no longer spoke of born of my bone, he you know, began to say, this woman, uh, I don't know why he didn't say, born of my bone gave me uh, the, the fruit and, and I ate. At that point now he, he says, uh, the, the, this woman. So you, you, you even see a change in the words that are, that are used there. But what we see in Adam's words, these are words of perfect harmony, perfect joy. Uh, I guess uh, maybe a situation that uh, we should long for. Something else that seems to point to perfect harmony in relationships is the fact that the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve were both naked and they had no shame. Now, nakedness, I guess uh, nowadays because of sin, is one of those things that uh, we, we, we do not like. Um, well, we, 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 we should be careful about, let me put it that way. I don't know that you have ever had dreams in which, uh, you, you know, dreams come in, in many 
shapes and forms. <laughs> but sometimes you, 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 can, you, you can dream, I don't know whether this means anything, whether it, it, you know, I, I, there are no psychologists who will begin to assess, uh, you know. But, but have you ever had a dream in which uh, you are walking in the mall, and you remember it's a dream, eh? And you are walking in the mall, and then suddenly you look and you find you are naked. <laughs> That's not a pleasant dream. It's not a pleasant dream. Nowadays, nakedness is something that we are not comfortable with, at least in most settings. Maybe when we are alone, yeah, we might be comfortable with nakedness, or maybe, uh, maybe just that spouse. That's the way it should be. Uh, let me not even entertain, uh, you know, somebody who is not a spouse, uh, you know. Or maybe if, if, if this, these are children, but it's very few people who, uh, you know, can be naked uh, with one another. You see, before sin came into the world, Adam and Eve were naked with each other and there was no problem. And I want to suggest that uh, nakedness is perhaps the ultimate version of transparency with one another. There was no shame with that kind of transparency. And what we see is that today, perhaps because relationships have been affected, we can no longer be that transparent with one another. And I'm not talking just now about physical nakedness, but I'm simply talking about just being transparent. And this is part of the reason why we lie to each other because we can't be quite transparent. But nakedness seems to have shown that relationships were in harmony at that particular time. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that uh, maybe you try to demonstrate harmony by, uh, by, by uh, you know, becoming naked in, uh, uh, you know, uh, inappropriate places. When you leave your house, I think uh, because of, of see what sin has done, uh, we, we, we should continue to dress ourselves before we come out of, uh, out of our rooms uh, and we come into, uh, into public. But what I'm trying to say here is, to me, when I read about this here, I don't think the Bible is just mentioning something. I think the Bible is depicting that ultimate transparency with one another and uh, there, was, there was no shame. There was no desire to hide from anyone. Now, when sin came, we, what we find is that when sin came, there was only Adam and Eve who were there. So we can only be able to describe the issue of harmony in human relationships on the basis of Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, well, I, I don't know if I'd say unfortunately or whatever, but sin came in very early. And so we don't have a description in the Bible of that perfect relationship between parents and children before sin came into the world. We just don't have it. Because by the time children were born, sin had already come. So unfortunately, we can't have you know, a, a description. We can't even see a story that depicts that. We don't have uh, you know, any depiction of siblings living in a perfect relationship. Because by the time the siblings, the first siblings came into the world, the world was already marred by sin. Extended families, in other words, how uncles and aunts in a perfect world were supposed to relate, we actually don't have that because, you know, it never happened, unfortunately. And even in laws and, and all these other kinds of relationships, we can only imagine now what it could have been like to have neighbors living in perfect peace and maybe to have in-laws living in perfect peace. But of course, it's only an imagination that we can have and maybe a longing because many of these relationships are tainted. Even the closest ones, they have been tainted. So what we do see then is that uh, sin disrupted these relationships. And with this we find that the relationship between Adam and Eve well, the two, the, the humanity, let me put it that way, let me not uh, uh, be confusing. The, the relationship between humanity, that is Adam and Eve, and how they related to their creator, that is disrupted. They are now hiding from God. They are now ashamed of being naked, but I think they, they were also ashamed of their sin. They now fear, we, we heard your voice and we were afraid. Fear is now a factor. And uh, defensiveness, did you eat? Uh, well, it's the woman that, uh, that, that you gave me. 
and you know, the blame is also coming in. And so, uh, these things that we experience, we continue to experience them, by the way, these things come because of the disruption that sin has caused. I want to suggest that uh, any kind of relationship that we find that has been marred, that, that, or rather that is, that is difficult for us, it is because those relationships have been marred by sin. If you are having any difficulties in relationships, the root cause of it, the absolute root cause of it, is sin. I'm not saying that the person you are fighting with has sinned, or that you have sinned, and you are causing it. But I'm simply saying we are living in a world of sin, and because of that, relationships are no longer what they used to be. So even among the best of people, the holiest of people, you may still find tensions that take place because we are living in an environment that has been marred by sin. That is the point that I'm trying to, uh, to mention here. And so we find that uh, even in, in that first family, murder occurs in the very first generation of Adam's offspring, Adam and Eve's offspring. One of them becomes a, murder, a murderer and the other becomes a victim of murder. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's what sin does, of course. And when we continue reading the Bible, we find that uh, violence, violence characterized humanity just before the flood. You will, here is a text that points to that and see how violence is actually mentioned. And of course, violence speaks to uh, disrupted relationships. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence. We could speak about other kinds of distortions in relationships as well, but uh, maybe violence is maybe just uh, uh, you know, one, of, uh, one of the manifest manifestations, and it could be perhaps uh, the ultimate manifestation of uh, those negative relationships. However, what we do see is that in God's perspective, relationships are not just an accessory. Relationships are the essence of the spiritual life. We find that at one time when Jesus was asked by a law, in fact, let's read it. He was asked by an expert in the law, testing him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. I think you can see here that the requirements that God gives, that Jesus gives, are about loving. That's a relationship. It's not just a doing thing. It is a relationship that is critical, that is at the center of everything. So Christ says, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Then Jesus says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think we can see that this is also relational. This is relational. Then Jesus actually says, the law and the prophets hang on these commandments. The law and the prophets that's just a way of saying the Old Testament, which were the scriptures at that time. I think maybe if the New Testament was there, Christ would have also included that. Because ultimately, God's expectations of us are in relationships, relating to him and relating to the other people that he has created. That is the essence of the Christian life the essence of the spiritual life. So then Christ characterized the requirements by simply saying, you must love God, you must love your neighbor. And I am saying this is a relationship. An interesting thing is that Christ actually seems to suggest that there is no hierarchy between these two commandments. In other words, you can say, well, let me just do the most important one and get uh, 60%. Let's put it in the, in the form of, uh, of getting marks. Uh, Christ doesn't seem to be saying, well, if you love 
God, you get 60%, therefore you can pass. But Christ actually says the second one is like the first one, which suggests to me that we should not be making them into a hierarchy. That is to say, well, for me, I will love my God with all my heart, with all my mind, and with all my soul, and then loving others, well, it's optional. I will love them if they are good. Christ actually seems to say they are equally important. There is no hierarchy between the two of them. And so I am not just talking about relating to human beings tonight. I'm talking about the fact that the whole Christian life is about relationships, relating to God, but relating also to people, to human beings. And I guess because in our own setting, it, it seems quite often, quite often it seems to be easier to relate to God because he doesn't mess around with us. But human beings are the difficult ones because they, we interact with them every day. And so there is a certain, to a certain extent, I may be highlighting a little more on how we relate to one another. But we should remember that actually we cannot relate to one another without relating to God. Neither can we relate to God and yet choose not to relate to one another. Because the Bible says, if somebody says, I love God, but does not love, you know, that same person does not love his neighbor, he is a liar. In other words, it's not really possible for someone to love God and yet not love another person. Okay? And we may also say it's not really possible to entirely love another person but not loving God. We may have certain kinds of affection, but the, the true quality of love that God expects from us, it is something which comes when uh, we truly love God, and then he helps to generate it. And so I have uh, this little bit of a graphic that I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm putting there, basically pointing to the fact that the cross of Jesus helps us to see the vertical dimension of love, but also the horizontal one. And that is very well depicted, I guess, by the fact that the cross itself has the vertical beam and also the horizontal beam. That should remind us that if we are truly, uh, you know, believers in the cross of Jesus, then that should make us to relate vertically to God, but also relate horizontally to others. So those who are subject to the cross of Christ will see those two dimensions, that is the, the vertical side as well as the horizontal side. And I am trying to uh, depict it by those arrows there that uh, there is that relationship, our relationship to God is solid, but there is also another relationship with humanity that we should be mindful of, and we should not think that it is optional. It is something that is part of the deal. And we find then that religions that actually don't have a cross, they simply want to relate to the higher being. They tend to tremble on other, on other human beings, and this is where you find persecutions and trying to force other people to, to, to relate. And by the way, if you subscribe to a religion that believes in forcing other people, you should ask yourself if there is really a cross in that religion. Is it really God's way of doing things? Because God is not interested only in you doing certain rituals to him but he is also interested in how you relate to other human beings that he has created. On the other hand, I'm also saying that sometimes we have social movements that don't have anything to do with the cross, but uh, they are philanthropic organizations. They are good, we don't want to say that they are useless. They are good, they do a lot of good. But perhaps their good is limited because ultimately the quality of love that they have is not the same one that emanates from the cross. 
It is when that love emanates from the cross that we find that truly holistic element and we find that uh, when, uh, you know, when, when, when there is that recognition of the, of the higher being and, or, you know, God himself, let's, 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 let's speak of God. When we recognize God <coughs> and um, we, 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 we are subject to the cross, and, yet, and, and we also understand that we must care about other, other you know, human beings. Then we find that there is synergy that takes place. Something happens to how we treat each other and the quality of life that, uh, that takes place there. It is no longer about me not caring about my neighbor and the kind of care that I give, it is something which is much deeper and much more holistic. Um, and so we find <clears throat> that uh, Christ taught that we should love God and we should also love our neighbor. And I want to say that teaching was not a new teaching. Christ was not making it for the first time. Because actually, you will find that in Jesus' time, there is someone who came to Jesus to test him, and he says, which is the greatest command? This is another of the, of, of the teachers of the, of the law. He asked uh, Jesus, which is the, uh, you know, well, well, what must I do? He actually, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That was his question. Well, Jesus decided to throw the question back at him. And he knew the answer. He knew the answer. It's an answer that Christ said to somebody else, but this scribe also knew the answer. This is why I'm saying it's not a new teaching. So when he was asked, he was asked you know, what is written in the law? How do you read? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your might. We saw that. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. So those two elements are there. And then Jesus simply said to him, do this and you will live. You can read the rest of the story in Luke chapter 10. This is where the story of the Good Samaritan comes from, but we're not going into that. But actually what we do find is that those words that Christ said were actually in the Old Testament. The book of Deuteronomy had mentioned that. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 and 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's what Christ said. Then it says, you know, it says these, these commandments should be written upon your heart. So again, you see, this is heart religion. It's a relationship which was taught even in the Old Testament. And then in Leviticus, <clears throat> we find the other part that Jesus quoted. Leviticus 19 verse 18, do not seek revenge or beg a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So this is God's expectation from the Garden of Eden all the way through to where we are. Loving God and loving others. Sadly though, love grew cold. Unfortunately, because of sin, love grows cold. I want to quickly point out to the fact that in Jesus' own time, you know, Jesus' time, among some of the, uh, the people, the, the, you know, the enemies of Jesus, the, uh, the people who came to him and they were trying to, tri you know, to trick him and so on, one of the things that characterized them is the fact that they did not have true love. They focused on rituals. And Christ, from time to time, wanted to point them to the importance of relating not only to God, but relating to people. So at one time, Jesus had to speak to the Pharisees. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, is just one that I have, uh, that I have taken there as a, sem as a symbol. Christ says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. These were small little plants that people were tithing. Okay? But Jesus' complaint was, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice. Now when you deal with issues of justice, it is how you relate to other people. Are you being just in how you deal with other people? Christ actually says these were the weightier matters of the law. And then he spoke about mercy. And normally you exercise mercy on those who are defenseless. So Christ was pointing to what you can do, or rather how you relate to people you don't have to be nice to. 
You don't have to be nice to those people, but you do it out of being gracious. You are feeling merciful towards them. So maybe if I may just mention here, if you want to know how you treat people, it's not how you treat, if you are a student, it's not how you treat your lecturers. That doesn't count. You want marks. <laughs> it doesn't count. It's not how you relate to your boss at work. Doesn't count. You want a salary, you want to keep the job. It is how you relate to the people who don't have power. That is what really counts. So Christ then challenged these uh, uh, religious leaders because they had forgotten the weightier matters of the law. The religious leaders would often contend with Jesus for healing the sick on Sabbath. Because they wanted him to keep certain rituals. They believed he had broken the Sabbath by healing, by being kind and doing a kind deed to someone. But uh, actually, the, the surprising thing is, because they were so annoyed with him for healing on the Sabbath, they would plan to kill him also on the Sabbath. Ah. Also on the Sabbath, they would plan to kill him. And in fact, when we read about uh, how they conducted some of the leaders, the priests and the other leaders, how they conducted the, the crucifixion after Christ and the other two people were crucified, well, they didn't want bodies hanging on the Sabbath. They thought it would desecrate, uh, desecrate the Sabbath. In other words, it would make it not to be holy if there are bodies, uh, if there are people who are there hanging on the, uh, on the cross on Sabbath. So the Bible tells us that uh, they actually made a request that uh, we should do something to speed up the death of these people. You can read the text there. Now it was uh, the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jews did not want bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked the pilot to have legs broken and the bodies to be taken down. So try to think about it, actually having someone's legs broken. Why? Because we want to make sure the Sabbath is special. Okay. So uh, obviously, true religion is not about only those kinds of observances. Now, I'm not saying Sabbath observance is not important, but I'm simply saying sometimes we get our priorities wrong and we fail to recognize the importance of relationships. Now I want to say a few things about the positive relationships in the apostolic and early church. Uh, when Jesus left his disciples, they still had problems, they still had a lot of things to learn, they were still quibbling with one another, but things seemed to have worked out. Christ had given them the seed and it was germinating. So we find that in the apostolic church, that is the apostolic church is the church, after Christ had gone back to heaven, the apostles uh, were still alive, the time when they were still alive. We find that that apostolic church, they catered for each other's needs. They were relating to each other. And this is what we should take as a blueprint. It was the beginnings of the Christian church. The Bible tells us, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, that they were breaking bread together from house to house. And in fact, that same text says they were living in, in harmony. They were in one accord. The Bible says some versions say. So the apostolic church was good. Notice also that they had all things in common. We are not even there you know, at this time. They had all things in common. Acts chapter 4 verse 32. No one called anything his own. I find that uh, people ask, whose car is standing there? I still call it mine. So we probably still have uh, you know, some way to go in getting to the place where I'm not saying it is wrong for us to have uh, personal property. I don't think the Bible speaks against it, but I'm simply saying the apostolic church had set the bar very high uh, for, for, uh, for us. In fact, there are some who sold land so that they could be able to provide for others. So not only giving money, but actually going to land that they have. Let's sell money so that we can be able to share with those who don't have. That's how they were relating to one another. I want to suggest that maybe this is also a sort of a beginning time. Christianity was setting root and God through his Holy Spirit 
was showing how we can have as perfect or as you know as perf as much uh, a perfect harmony as possible in a world of sin, still marred by sin, but people are kind of trying to approximate, trying to get as close as possible to what that original was. And here they are doing these kinds of things. When there were perceptions of uh, inequality that were seen in the church in Acts chapter 6, the church addressed it in ways that, uh, that would try to preserve the harmony that they had. Relationships were important. Dorcas was missed by the people that she, she ministered to because they were reaching out Maybe not only to people who are within the church, but even outside. So relationships and ministering to one another, very important. When there was a, a famine, if you read about you can read about it in Acts chapter 11, verse 28, uh, going down to 30. When there was a famine, the church made collections in various places to help those who were especially struck by that famine. They were relating to one another. That is the ideal that they had for themselves. And coming outside the apostolic church to the early church, we find that there are testimonies that the church continued to love one another. There is uh, one of the church fathers, one of the leaders of the church, I've put in there the approximate years uh, in which he lived. His name is Justin Mata because uh, he was martyred. So he's called Justin Mata. But it is said that, he said this, Justin Mata is said to have, to, to have said this, we who used to value, in other words, before we were believers, we used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else. Now, bring what we have into a common fund and share it with anyone who needs it. So it looks like even past the apostles, the church was still doing that. Then he goes on to say, we used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of other race or country. Now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and pray for our enemies. That is the kind of relationship that the early church had. And in a sense, maybe we should be approximating that. Another church father, Tertullian, um, again, those are his approximate, uh, you know, the, the approximate life, uh, life, lifetime around those years. He is reported to have said that when the Romans talk about Christians, even though they persecute us, they say, but see how they love one another. They're still persecuting them, but see how they love one another. And maybe that is one of the things which made the Christian church to actually grow in those times. Amen. Christ mentioned that... Uh, when we reach the end times, or as we get closer and closer to his second coming, love would grow cold. Take note of Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 to 13. It says, uh, these are the signs, signs of, this, uh, of the second coming. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to, to death, and you will be hated by all nations. So there will be hatred taking place there. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray one another. That means maybe even some who are believers will begin to betray one another and hate one another. And then the Bible says, uh, verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And I think this is characterizing these end times that we are living in. Because Christ here is talking about the time just before his second coming. These are the signs of uh, his coming. So he predicts that love will grow old. Likewise, Paul also depicted that in the end times, the end times will be characterized by lack of love. Take a look at this uh, in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. It says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. So love will be there, but each one will be loving himself. Oh. And quite often, if you, 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 you just open your eyes and, and look at what uh, people say on WhatsApp, it looks like uh, there is a much greater emphasis on loving yourself. I'm not saying it's, 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 a, it's wrong to love yourself. Christ says you should love others, you love yourself. So yes, you should have a healthy love for yourself. But very, 
uh, you, you know, very often in, you know, in uh, today's society, you find that there seems to be an overemphasis in the loving self and in beginning with self. Take care of yourself. And that's not wrong, but uh, there should also be an equal emphasis on the loving others and taking care of others. Uh, people will love themselves and they will be lovers of money. They will be boastful. Take a look, many of the things I'm reading here, they relate to, to how we, uh, you know, uh, they are about how we relate to one another or how we treat one another. Boastful. You can't be boastful when you're just by yourself. They will be proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. That also pertains to relationships. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving. That, that relates to treatment, how we relate to one another. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasures rather than love of, uh, lovers of God. So maybe even the love for God also is diminished. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Have nothing to do with them. So many of the vices that we saw there, they have something to do with, uh, with uh, you know, relating to other people. However, I mentioned here that uh, it's not as if it will be totally new only in the end times. We have this text here, I'm not going to read it, in Romans chapter 1, verse 29, where we, Paul actually said in those times, some of those same things were also there as well. So I'm not suggesting that uh, you, you know, they were in a perfect world, those things were there. But it would appear that what Christ and Paul are saying is that in the end times there will be an intensification of those negative behaviors, things that affect human relationships. But while we have that intensification of uh, those vices, we also see that there is a prediction, there is a recognition that among believers, love will be the insignia. It will be the mark of those who are Christ's disciples. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This has not stopped to be uh, you know, a principle we should live by. It is still true for us today. In fact, what we do find is that in the end times, there is a prediction that there will be a ministry or the ministry of Elijah. I don't have time to explain what that is, but we believe that as a church, those of us who are living in the last days, we are carrying out the mission of Elijah or the ministry of Elijah. And the role of that includes restoration of relationships. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. God says, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Those are the end times. This was partially fulfilled in the time when Christ came for the first time. The Bible tells us so. But it is also true for the end times. Uh, in, in fact, it mentions here before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And notice the work of Elijah. It will be to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. It's a restoration of relationships. <laughs> now, some people look at this, and I think they could be right, that he's talking about family relationships. Children and their parents somehow there should be a restoration of that love. And of course this can be broadened to other kinds of relationships as well. But other people look at this and they say, well, maybe it is talking about children as believers being restored to their heavenly father. But that's also another type of, rest, uh, of relationship. And that is consistent with what we have been saying uh, tonight, that the Christian life, the life of the believer, it is about that vertical relationship, but also the horizontal relationships, the social relationships that we have. In fact, what we do see is that relationships are so important. Not only did Christ, or rather God predict that there will be a messenger to restore relationships, but in fact, we find that preparedness for the second coming of Jesus it is somehow related to how people relate to others. 
It's not just about persecution. Let me read a couple of par parables that Jesus told. In Matthew chapter 24, remember Matthew 24 deals with um, the second coming of Jesus. From verse 45, it says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? So the faithful servant gives the other fellow servants their food at the right time. Then it says, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants. It's treatment that, you, that, that we are dealing with here. Treatment of how other, I mean, it's how we treat other people that seems to be uh, of, uh, of importance in this parable. So he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunkards. I suspect he is eating what should belong to the others. Because the other one is giving them food at the proper time. But this one is busy eating. I'm not sure whether he's eating only what belongs to him or he's also eating what should actually belong to others or what should be given to others. By the way, when God gives us blessings, we are supposed to be channels of blessings to others. Amen. The master of that servant will come at a, on a day he does not expect. And at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. Then there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In my youth, my childhood, I often saw people depicting uh, this parable uh, in the form of a skit. And you know what? There was a general misunderstanding because when people wanted to depict that this servant was unfaithful, they would show him busy drinking, yes, but he would go and sleep in the master's bedroom and he would do all kinds of things that were against the master. But very often people forgot that the essence of the parable is about how he treats others. And I think that is something that is important for us. The quality of our spirituality is not only based on how long we kneel. Ah. It is also related to how we relate to others. That is important. I think you can see this parable is about end times. Notice this one here. I'm not going to read it all, but this is about the sheep and the goats. Matthew chapter 25, also talking about the judgment. And notice when the people who will be accepted, Christ will say, look at verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then uh, we are told here yeah, when they are wondering when they did that, Christ will say, I tell you the truth, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did to me. Notice again, it is to the least. It's not when you offer to do a favor for your, uh, for your boss or for your lecturer or for someone like that. It is when you offer to do a favor to somebody who doesn't have any power over you. And likewise, those who will be rejected, it is because they never gave their food, they never visited. And when they are surprised, we never saw you. When did we fail to do this? It is when we fail to do those things to, to others. I want to draw to a close by reading a few texts of scripture that point to the perfect harmony that will be uh, after Christ makes this world anew. The Bible teaches, even from Old Testament times, a vision of that perfect harmony after God finally restores the planet Earth to what it was before sin. And uh, we're going to take a look at a, a few texts from Isaiah here. And you will see that it talks about perfect harmony, not just among people, but with nature itself. This will be the ultimate of the perfect, harmonious life. Isaiah says here in chapter, five, verse, uh, verse five, chapter 11, verse 5 to 10, 
Also, righteousness will be the belt on his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. There will be perfect harmony in nature, where a little boy, a toddler, will lead a lion and a leopard and so on. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And then it mentions that the, the, the nesting child will play at the hall of the cobra. The wind child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in, uh, in all my holy mountain. Uh, that's what God says. There are also other passages. I'm just quickly going to a few others so we don't stay here too long. In chapter 2, verse 2 and 4, 2 to 4, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Uh, so that, and then it says, so that we may walk in his path. So they are coming and they want, they, they are interested in him. And then look at this, it says, he, God, will judge between the nations and settle disputes. In other words, there will be no more disputes among the nations. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up a sword against the nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Oh. You see, all those machine guns, if we're just to do a, you know, uh, maybe another re-reading of it, swords turned into plowshares. Let's just put it in our own language. The machine guns, they'll be made into laptops and cell phones. <laughs> now that's something which does not hurt, mm. something which has other uses. There will be no need for any of those. I want to suggest, as I come to a close, that we call ourselves the remnant. And I think rightly so. What is the remnant? The remnant, or a remnant is, we usually speak of it in terms of a fabric or even a carpet. When they sell carpets, they cut you off the piece that you need and you lay it in your house. And of course you use it. And as you use it, of course, um, it gets worn out. It's because it's, it's, uh, you know, it has been sold. But the remnant is what actually, it's what remains, what, what remains unused. That is, the, that is the remnant. So try to imagine maybe you bought a carpet, maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and you put it in your house and uh, you used the house, and it looks kind of like that. Uh, not, not very nice. But you happen to go back to that shop and let us assume that they have a remnant that remained that they never sold. And it still looks pristine like that. When we speak of ourselves as the remnant, we are implying that there is something about us that depicts the original. Am I making sense? When we call ourselves the remnant, we are saying after the earth has wasted human relationships, there is something about us that should depict the original. Uh, that's what we are implying. And so as the remnant church, we are not wrong when we begin to say we should restore the Sabbath because it was part of the original. We are not wrong when we do that. And when we look at all other things and we try to compare ourselves with the apostolic church and we try to compare ourselves with what God established at Eden, we are not wrong. But we should be mindful that being remnant also has something to do with relationships. Relationships the way they were at the beginning, that 
should be our blueprint. And relationships, the way we anticipate that they will be when the earth is made new, that is our blueprint if we are truly the remnant. And so our role as the remnant is to try to look at that origin and say we long for that origin when there was perfect harmony. But we also have that future. We know God is preparing a future in which swords will be converted to plowshares. What it means is that we should begin to live in that future. It means whatever swords we have, we should actually begin to change them into plowshares. May God help us that indeed we may live with that remembrance of the perfect relationships at the beginning and also with that vision of the perfect relationship that God has in mind for us. And in these last days, we actually begin to live that future. May God bless you. Amen. Amen.